his heart The mystery he lavishes on us Oh, as deep cries out too deep Oh, how desperately he wants us Things of earth stand next to him like a candle to the sun. One failing father, what compares to his great love? His holy Son, the Lion and the Lamb given to us. All the Word became a man, so my soul could know its Savior. Taken for the sake of all mankind, salvation is in his blood. Jesus Messiah, the right just died for love.
then sings my soul my God and he who was and is to come prepare the way until the work on earth is done Watch as the clouds he rides swing low Lift up a sound as we make his, his throne
I seek you The more I find you The more I find you The more I love you I want to sit at your feet Drink from the cup in your hand Lay back against you and breathe Feel your heart beat This love is so deep more than I can stand and I melt in your peace I want to sit at your feet drink from the cup in your hand lay back against you and breathe feel your heart beat this love is so deep it's more than I can stand oh I melt in your peace it's overwhelming I want to sit at your feet drink from the cup in your hand lay back against you and breathe feel your heart beat this love is so deep, it's more than I can stand. Oh, I melt in your peace, it's overwhelming. It's so more than I can stand Oh, I melt in your peace It's overwhelming Oh, it's overwhelming Oh, it's overwhelming Keep us here until we're 
feet drink from the cup in your hand lay back against you and breathe then feel your heart beat this love is so deep it's more than I can stand I'm melting in your peace it's over It's overwhelming Oh, it's overwhelming Jesus, you overwhelm me With your goodness, you overwhelm It's overwhelming. Lord, love you this morning. I'm thankful for your word, thankful for the worship. And um, Lord, I pray that, that worship is more than just a song we sing, but it is a life we live. Continue to transform our hearts and our lives in Christ Jesus. Be with us as we open up your words. Speak to us in a way that reveals not only who we are, but who you want us to become. And uh, we long to be more, more like you every day. Amen. Everybody turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 11. And I want to, over the next couple of weeks, I want to try to unpack uh, a truth in this that I honestly have never preached about. And I think that is important. Now, I will be honest with you, some of what I'm going to be doing today is kind of laying some groundwork for what I'm going to try to bring to conclusion next week. Um, There's a lot of reference in this particular text made to Old Testament text, Old Testament uh, prophecies, and things of that nature. So, I want you to be mindful of that. Uh, Some of this will be lost on you as we read it, but I will slowly unpack it, uh, and maybe most of this the answer to your question we will unpack next week. Um, I won't leave you totally hanging today, this week or this morning, but I will. Uh, there may be some things that are going unanswered, but I will come back and, and deal with those. We'll start at verse 11, Romans 11, verse 11, and this is quite a bit of text to get through. We're going to go all the way through, I don't know, let's say 27. And um, it says, I say then, this is, Paul, this is Paul, not Spall, but this is Paul speaking. He says, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not. But through their fall, to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Now, this fall that is speaking about is just speaking about the Israelites. It's speaking about the Jewish people. It's speaking about the fact that they have been given, a, they were given a calling to be light to the Gentiles, to be salt to the Gentiles. That was their calling. But they fell from that call. They did not fulfill that call, and they did not live up to that call. Sounds like the church today, doesn't it? Sounds much like the church today that we have, we proclaim and we profess a God, we worship a God, and yet we fall short on living as light in the world And so he speaks to this fall, and he says that um, they will be provoked to jealousy because because of their fall, salvation will actually come to the Gentiles. Now, if their fall is riches for the world, and their, their failure riches for the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? For I speak to you Gentiles in so much... Inasmuch as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. If by any means I may provoke to jealousy those who are my flesh and save some of them, for it, if their being cast away is the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from death? For it is the first fruit, for if the first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy. 
And if the root is holy, so are the branches. Here we are back into the trees again. It's all through the Bible. God speaks to them um, in parables. He speaks to them in metaphors. He uses them speaking of the kingdom and how we should abide to the vine. It is all through here. And now he is speaking and he is saying there are, there are two types of olive trees. There are the wild olive trees. There are the olive trees that he refers to as being the, um, or branches um, on uh, olive trees that are on the Mount of Olives. But you do boast, remembering that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off that I, may, that I might be grafted in. And he's speaking to the Gentiles. <clears throat> well said, because of unbelief, they were broken off, and you stand by faith. Now he's saying, because of unbelief, speaking of the Jews, speaking of the Israelites, they were broken off. Because of unbelief, the branches were broken off. And you, he's speaking to the Gentiles, you were grafted in. So I brought you in to the fellowship and into their promise. Now for all Gentiles, all those who are lost, all those who are far from Christ, now we have been brought into the blessing that the Israelites were blessed with. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either in verse 21. Verse 22, therefore consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fell. Severity, but towards you, goodness. If you continue in his goodness, if you continue in his goodness. Let me reread re- re- this. Therefore consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fell. Speaking of the Israelites, the severity. But towards you, Gentiles, goodness, if you continue in his goodness. It is important for us to understand that there is a continuing. You must continue in the way. You must endure, it says in the Bible, you must endure to the end. How does he test and know that you are his? If you endure to the end. If you continue in the goodness to the end. Those who do not were never his. You were never his. Otherwise, you will be cut off as well. You know what? He's, he's throwing back to this other time when he speaks of branches. John speaking of branches being cut off. He will cut you off because there are branches that appear to be branches that are not really branches. There are disciples who have the appearance of disciples but are not really disciples. You know what he does with those in the end? He cuts them off, he bundles them up, and he throws them in the eternal fire to be destroyed. Yay! And they also, if they do not continue in, in, in unbelief, and here's a good thing, if they do not continue in unbelief, guess what? I'll take the Jews, I'll take the Israelites, and I will graft them in. For God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, How much more will these, who are natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. And it is a mystery, isn't it? It is an intense mystery. Lest you should be wise in your own opinion. Let's talk about this. I want to really kind of zero in on this part. And then next week I want to back up and I want to talk a little bit more about the Jews and the Gentiles. I want to talk about being grafted in. But this week I want to talk about the mystery. For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. What mystery is he speaking about? He's speaking of the fact that the Israelites had failed their call. That God had removed them because of this failure and then he had grafted in the Gentiles and made a way for them to be connected to the promise. That's the mystery. And he does not want us to be ignorant of this mystery lest you should be wise in your own opinion. That blindness in part has happened to Israel until, until, there is an until. There is a specific set time that God will lift the blindness that he has put on Israel. In part, it has happened in part, has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. 
And so all Israel will be saved, as it is written. Verse 27, the final verse, the deliverer will come out of Zion, and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. We're going to talk about that next week. Uh, There's a lot to that. For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. When you come on Sunday morning, you gather, whether you gather in this house, whether you gather at home, whether you gather in your car, wherever you are, and you're logging in or you've joined us this morning, my hope for you is that you come anticipating and longing for truth. I mean, I want truth. But what I've come to know and discover in my life, and I've lived some, I've lived a little bit, I've lived a little longer than some and a little less than others, but what I've come to discover in my life, that truth will cost you something. And truth is never free. The Bible says you must buy the truth and sell it not. So we learn in his word that the truth comes at a price and it will cost you something. And truth is not something that you, that you have to invest in and then get recompense. You get a return on that investment. You Basically, truth isn't something that you sell because you make a mockery of it. Truth is not for sale. Truth is His. The only thing you get for free in this life is salvation, but salvation is free, but it is not cheap. Oftentimes we think that that which is free actually costs nothing, but it costs Jesus his life. It was free for you, but it cost him everything. Because salvation comes to us in process. I want to say this to you today, and I I think this is important, and maybe this is what I've been trying to phrase for a long time, and I could have just done it in a sentence, and we could have saved ourselves a lot of time over the last five years. I'll say this one sentence to try to sum up what I've been trying to say for five years in multiple sermons and multiple different ways. We're not saved yet. We are being saved day by day. For each of us here and, and those that are listening online, can you agree with me that we are not saved completely yet? Not. We're being saved day by day. Matthew 24, 13 says, He that endures to the end, this person will be saved. It does not say he who got baptized, he who prayed a prayer, he who stood up at a conference and and recited words will be saved. It does not say that. It says he who endures to the end will be saved. We are being saved day by day. There is an enduring that must happen, and it is in our enduring that he shapes us and makes us and forms us into who he wants us to be. We have not yet endured to the end, so we have not that salvation has not completed its process in us. Salvation is a process. Salvation did not, listen, and let, let, me, let, me, help, let me help you with this, because some, for some of you, you think salvation started when you prayed a prayer. See, salvation began before the foundations of the earth. It said that Jesus was slain before the foundations of the earth. So before God breathed and created the heavens and the earth, and he put us on it. Salvation began before that all happened. Salvation is still working itself out in our world, in our life, in our heart, in our mind. In our family, in our church. Revelation 13, 8 says the Lamb of God was slain before the foundations of the world. It was before and it is still, we must endure to the end. There was a before 
and there's an end. It says in Romans 11, towards the end, I want to really kind of drill in. The, the Apostle Paul is speaking of the mysteries. He said, mysteries are not hidden from us, but rather they are hid for us. The Bible says God conceals a thing, and it is the responsibility of kings to search it out. So in other words, if there's anything concealed, it doesn't belong to the devil, it belongs to God. And we continue to act like everything mysterious is demonic. No, no, no. What's mysterious is God. He speaks in mysteries. And He does it so that we will seek Him. Last week we said that the moment you feel like you've gotten close to God and you can touch Him, the moment you've drawn close to Him, He withdraws from you so you will continue to seek Him. See, mysteries are the thing that keep us chasing after Him. See, I'm afraid today in the church that some of us have, ta- have totally lost the mystery of our relationship with God. We have, we have defined Him. We have, we, have, we have said who He is. We, we have the theology down. We think we know everything there is to know about Him. We know about our denomination. We can recite our manual. We can cite our, our, our creed. We, we know everything there is to know about God. We put Him in a little box all night and nice and neat, and He is well-defined, and we have stopped seeking Him because we have properly defined Him in our limited thinking. God will not be defined by you. He is a mystery. There is nowhere in the Bible that it says there are answers in God. It's only the world that sings songs like Jesus is the answer for the world today. That's a hymn in case you didn't know. Jesus is the answer for the world today. But the Bible doesn't say Jesus is the answer. It doesn't say that. Jesus, if you know him, if you've met him, if you've heard about him, is way more questions. There's way more questions regarding Jesus than answers. I mean, you describe and break down for me the mystery of the incarnation. Why don't you break that? Why don't you use all of your degrees and all of your theology and all your schooling and all your pastoral years and all your years sitting inside the church and going to discipleship class and going to Sunday school class and getting the, the rows you got for attending Sunday school class perfectly? You, you, you explain the mystery of the ark incarnation and tell me exactly. You break that down for me. It's a mystery. It's a mystery. There's no answer there, folks. It's a mystery. That's why it requires faith. Faith is not the production of what you can hold in your hand. Faith is believing when there are no answers. Faith is not faith until it is applied to that that cannot be understood. You don't need faith for cars and homes. You need money. You need down payment. You need good credit. See, the problem is Some of you are trying to use faith when you just need to practice some good discipline. Some of us try to apply faith where we shouldn't apply faith to get what we want when we really need to apply faith, not for our cars, not for our house, not for our credit, not for our healing. We don't need to apply faith there. We need to apply faith when it comes to the mysteries of who God is. But we've stopped in the church applying faith to who he is, and we begin to apply it as word of faith over what we want. we, we We have stopped allowing God to be mysterious, and we've used what we should be using as faith towards him to get what we want as a crowbar in the church. Faith is required where you can't do it on your own. Some of you don't have a good car because you have bad credit and you're not responsible and you don't pay your bill. You don't need God. You need to get off your lazy butt and do what's right.
Some of us need to stop crying out for God. We're waiting on God to do what he's waiting on you to do. God ain't going to show up. He wants you to show up. The reality is the church has been praying for revival, but we are the hope for the revival. So instead of us praying for God to show up, we need to show up and do our part. See, the Israelites had failed to show up. God had called them to show up. God had called them to be the light to the world. God had called and commissioned them, and he had given them a promise, and they failed, and they fell short, it said. And God removed them and and grafted in people that he could trust to go be the light to the world. I came here today to tell you, will the church learn from this text and understand that we've been called to be light to the world and salt to the world? And if we don't, he'll remove us and graft somebody else in that will. That's good. There's not a lot of amens here. Can't ain't no people in here, but I just want to let you know it's good stuff. And we need to begin to ask this question. Have we have we have like, I, I, I just I, I'll just be honest with you, and, and of course, you know, maybe I'll calm down before you know next week, but I I'm tired of us having prayer meetings where we're praying for revival when we're called to be the revival. I'm sick of it. If I hear another pastor say, We need a revival in this nation, go be the revival in the nation and shut your mouth. I'm sick of it. I'm sick of us praying to do, for us to do what God has called us, for him to do what God has called us to do. I'm sick of it. I'm sick of sermons about it. I'm sick of prayer meetings about it. I'm sick of making people feel guilty about it. We don't need prayer. We need for the church to get off its butt and begin to be the church. That's what we need. And prayer ain't going to help you if you won't do, be the church. Because we were called to be light, and he's called us to be salt, but we won't be it. He can't be that for you. He called you to be that. Stop trying to get God. God to do what he's called you to do. It's stupid. I've had enough. I've just had enough. And let me tell you, I I really do believe that it is in the heart of the people that are under the sound of my voice. I believe it's in your heart to do this. Then go do it. You need to stop writing blogs about it. You need to stop Facebooking about it. You need to stop talking to your small group about how you're going to use your house as a mission field. You need, to stop, you need to stop talking about how much you love God, and you need to go be loved to the world. You need to walk and move and find your being in Him to such a degree that everywhere you go, you reshape the atmosphere of where you're at. It's time for the church to be the church and stop praying that God would do our job. I've had enough. Listen, you don't get, let me go, I'm just going to stay on it a little bit. You don't get unhealthy overnight. Let's just talk about the temporal. And, and you can be skinny and be unhealthy. And you can be fat and be unhealthy. But you didn't get there overnight. You worked hard at it. You worked hard at it. You made, you made choices every single day that multiplied things in your life. Like fat, like, you know what I mean? Like, like bad, bad blood pressure. See, that multiplied, see, because what you sow in, you get a multiplication. You reap a harvest for. Some of you are plentiful because you're unhealthy. But you're not plentiful in the areas you want to be plentiful. But see, here's the thing. We want to pray, pray a faith prayer that God would just make us healthy again. When has that prayer ever been answered? When have you ever seen somebody just, just, when when in the Bible, when have you seen somebody that was totally unhealthy? Now, I'm not talking about sick. I'm talking about unhealthy because they just poured a bunch of junk in their life. Go to God and God deliver them. Listen, I'm telling you right now, I just, I haven't seen it. I didn't see, I've never, we've never, we've seen people healed of cancer. We've seen people healed of blindness. We've seen people healed of all kinds of diseases. But I'm telling you, you have an unhealthy, overweight person come down here. You can pray all day long. God said, I've given you, I've given you everything you need to know and to do to become healthy. Eat better, exercise. But see, we would rather just pray a prayer and have him miraculous change us when he's already given us everything we need to do. Some of us are praying for God to do what he's already given for you to do. See, the key to that is to do these things. Eat healthy. Isn't this good? It's good. But we don't want to do the right stuff. 
And this is like the church. We don't want to do it. See, I, I've spent years getting unhealthy. I, I've spent years being apathetic towards God spiritually. I've spent years of not reading the Bible. I've spent years uh, of doing these, of, of having a bad attitude. I've spent years of being angry. And we go, God, God, help me, help me to be patient. And he goes, okay, I'm going to give you some opportunities so you can exercise and learn patience. So I'm going to make all hell break loose in your life so that you can actually learn how to be patient. So now your dog's going to bite you and your wife's going to be mean to you and your kids are going to roll their eyes at you. And now you have an opportunity to begin to exercise a muscle that you failed to use your whole life because you're too lazy to actually live it out when you want to pray prayers that I would just give you something that it takes opposition to exercise. See, we use faith to get what we want instead of using faith to embrace the mysteries of God. Okay, this is good. Romans eleven twenty five. 25. For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this, mer- of this mystery. Do you hear that? Paul said he does not desire that we should be ignorant of the mystery. That should encourage you. We think mysteries are something we, we should not understand. Paul says it's a mystery, but I don't want you to be ignorant of it. So this is a mystery he wants us to know about. The moment we hear mystery, we say to ourselves, that belongs to God. I'm going to leave it alone. Now, you may not always get an answer to your question, but God is not intimidated by your questions. We become afraid to ask him questions. Some of us don't ask us questions because we think we already know all the answers. Some of us are so holy, so spiritual, we know more than everybody else, and so we don't even ask God questions anymore as if we think that he is not bigger than what we think he is. That's called religion. We, we just stop learning. and We've gotten lazy and apathetic. We've become placid in our life. We've become peaked because we no longer pursue him and seek him. We have not woken from our slumber and realized he's not even there anymore. We don't want to do the necessary work to continue to discover new things about who he is. Romans eleven twenty five. 25, for I do not desire, brethren, that you should become ignorant of this mercy, lest you should be wise. Listen, here's, here's the reason. Here's the reason. Lest you should be wise in your own opinions. Listen, this is so important. Because some of you have failed to experience spiritual encounters with him because you function in your own wisdom and you don't trust the truth that you can only discover by being led by the Spirit. See, the Holy Spirit was put into your life to lead you to truth. But some of you don't consult the Holy Spirit because you already know all there is to know about God. You, you don't seek him anymore. It takes work to seek people. How many of you have played hide and seek? I want to propose to you today, you never truly find God. Come on, let me, let, you don't have to like this. You, you can, I give you permission to disagree with this part of my, of my sermon. I give you permission. I give you permission to go home and seek it out. I'm kind of just saying it to see if I can mess you up enough to actually go read your Bible this week. Listen to me. It says, you will find me. You seek me. If you seek me with all your heart, you will find me. I want you to name for me one one person today who has sought God with their entire heart. So it is, in essence, it is as if God is saying, I want you to always be seeking me. And I want you to do it with as much of your heart as you can. And now we discover things about him. We get answers along the way. But let me tell you, you never truly find him because if you found him, you would put him in a box and you'd keep him there. And you'd control him. And you would try to do what Peter did on the mountain and lock God up in your spiritual enlightenment and, and as if you are special because you have, you have seen God in a dimension that no one else has seen God. And he said, you will never find me because you will, you will never fully seek me with all your heart. That's my belief on that. You read through that. God wants you to chase him and seek after him and long for him. It is a mystery because it is in the mysteries that we begin to seek him. Listen, sermons that are totally understandable to you, that you agree with everything I'm saying, do not drive you home to seek God. 
And the reality is, today in our world, we have ministers of the gospel that are preaching such simple messages that do not stir in the hearts of men and women a desire to long to know more about him. And we got to begin to preach deeper messages to a deeper crowd because the moment you became a believer, it said the Holy, I want you, the Holy Spirit came in you and the Holy Spirit only dwells over deep stuff. In the beginning was was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Holy Spirit hovered over the face of the deep. Everywhere the Holy Spirit is, is the deep. You know how the deep cries out to the deep? The Holy Spirit is the deep. You know how the deep cries out to the deep? We actually preach deep. When we preach deep, it cries out to the deep, and the deep respond accordingly. We need to preach deeper messages so people live deeper lives so that we affect people for his kingdom. That's good. In other words, the Lord had to reveal this. Doctrine not based on mystery produces pride. That's why if you want to understand the Eucharist, as Protestants tend to refuse to believe that bread and wine would actually be body and blood, but they only view it as a memorial, it is only for the sake of the remembrance. There is, in other words, there's not something supernatural happening every time we we take the Eucharist. We, we only do it to remember him. Well, if it was only for remembrance, then why does Paul say if you eat it or drink it wrong, you might get sick or you might die? I, I don't know about you, but I've never had any photo that, I, that I've seen on Facebook when it flashes back up of what happened two years ago that's made me sick or killed me. I've never had a memory kill me. I've never had a memory or something we do for remembrance, remembrance sake to make me sick. There is something spiritual happening in the Eucharist. Every time there's something temporal happening, there's something spiritual happening. There's a mysterious element to what we are partaking in. And if we take it and do it lightly, we might become ill physically. If we degrade the divinity, we diminish the temporal. It is in the degradation of the divinity of God that we open ourselves up to have our temporal diminished. Let me, let me say it this way. Every time we honor the spiritual, it affects the flesh. Every time we dishonor the spiritual, it affects the flesh. Every time we do something in the temporal that has also been labeled as a spiritual key of the kingdom, it also helps us temporally. Let me break it down for you this way. He tells us that when you tithe, when you bring each week your first fruits and you give it, you do not give it to Echo Church, you do not give it to the pastor, but it first ascends in the spiritual to the right hand of the Father at the feet of Jesus. And he approves what you have done. And he takes your cursed money because of your first fruit and turns it into blessed money. And then it is returned in the spiritual. It goes to the Heavenly Father and is returned back down to the church or the leaders of the church to disperse it and to use it according to how God intends for it to be used. Now, track with me now. So every time we honor this, we understand that there is a spiritual thing happening in the midst of our temporal thing. Some of you don't see things happening in the spiritual because you're not faithful in the temporal. And some of you are praying for a move of God when he's praying for you to move so that what your movement does, is since the Heavenly Father is approved of, that he can make a move happen from the spiritual into the temporal. Let me say it to you this way. You're praying for a move of God, but everything that has substance here on earth first starts in the unseen. <laughs> if you need your finances to turn around, you need to give your finances to the spiritual. Because that which you hope for, the... the, the, the the substance of that which you hope for and the evidence of that which is unseen is we need to begin to give so it is ascends to the unseen so that he can do something with it so it can descend back to the temporal and change our lives. Track me. There is, when, when Jacob had, okay, I'm, I don't want, I'm not going off path, this is really important. 
Jacob and the ladder. Jacob had a dream that there was a ladder and it was extending from the earth to the heavenlies. Now, this is important. And angels were ascending and descending on the ladder. Now, listen to me. It does not say descending and ascending. It says that the angels were ascending and descending. It's speaking of the spiritual nature of of our lives where we ascend to the heavenlies and we descend to do the work We are empowered in the heavenlies and we come down. Our tithe is ascended and it descends. It ascends to get power and descends. These are keys of the kingdom. Our prayers, they ascend and they descend. We need to understand that everything we do has a spiritual dimension to it. Let me make this simple in this way. Even a smile has a spiritual dimension to it. When you go to the grocery store and you smile at people, some of you it's going to be hard because you got a nasty old gnarly face all the time. And it's going to be hard. But you see this smile. Some of you are like, you need to smile more when you're preaching. But um, you need to smile. You need to smile when you go in there. You can actually reshape an atmosphere. Because that smile is temporal. But that smile is offered up to ascend and to descend with power to affect your atmosphere. We got to be careful. I prefer to search out mysteries because they keep me humble. It's the mysteries that I'm after. Revelation can never produce pride if it's true revelation. I mean, that's good. Just, just, just sit there for a second. Because everybody in church wants to talk about getting revelation. I read that scripture and I got revelation. I, 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 I had this encounter and I got revelation. And, and then you, and watch where the conversation goes because you can know if it's true revelation by who tries to get the credit. The moment that you try to grab the credit, credit it was not revelation because revelation is God's and God's alone. See, there's a lot of smart people that can seem like they have revelation. But they're not humble people. And Paul is speaking to them and says, For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion. See, there are a lot of people who have become wise in their own opinion. They're wise in their own opinion. They're not wise spiritually. There's two different. There's a worldly wisdom and there's a spiritual wisdom. He's speaking of these two right here. He's saying that the people that, that do not trust the mysteries of God or seek out the mysteries of God are constantly pursuing the mysteries of God. People that, 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 that don't get true revelation are those who become prideful in their heart. It is his revealed truth he shared to me. And it belongs to whomever has an ear to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. That's why I'm a little concerned today. Um, I'm going to say this. I'm just a little concerned today that we are taking revelation and we're trying to pimp out the truth by selling it on the market of spiritual churches. And we're making profit off of what was God's and what is for the sake of the people. Listen to me now. I'm not saying everybody that sells their stuff is bad. I'm not saying that. I'm, I'm saying, listen to me. Listen to me. What has the church become? It is not a marketplace to make money and proceeds off of truth. Some of you in here today are, are, are going to be like, well, what is tithe? Tithe is a necessary requisite. It is a command from God. It is, I'm not trying to sell tapes and stuff. I want you to understand something. And I'm each to each their own. But what I'm saying for my personal self is I've gone back and forth about this over and over again because I want to provide for my family and I want to do these things and I have specific gifts that lean into what we do in the church. But he said that revelation is for whomever has ears to hear, not who can afford it. See, the problem is this profiteer mindset doesn't just infiltrate the church by its leadership. It infiltrates the church by its fellowship. And we have people that want to profit 
off of Revelation. And God says, listen, if you begin to use Revelation to get into certain circles so you can be special, that's wrong. That's prideful. I'd rather be a mystery to you than you to think you know me and use me for your good pleasure. That's why whenever we get a revelation, I just want to recommend to you, it'd be best to not kiss and tell. It'd be best for in that moment of intimacy for you to be between you and God. And, and the moment you begin to tell, now you're held accountable to that revelation you've been given. And many of us, I'd say a great portion of us, don't even do it. The, those that tell about all the things God's told them to do very seldomly live up to anything that they profess that they were told to do that they said they were going to do. Because we didn't, we didn't value the revelation for revelation's sake. We value the revelation to make it seem like God speaks to me and he, I'm special. We profit. Whether, whether through relationship, we profit. Whether through finances, we profit off of our relationship. The church has become much more like the temple that Jesus walked into that began to be made a whip and whip the money changers out because they were profiting off of what was made for the masses and for whoever would have an ear to hear. And profit, profiting is not just financial. It's relational. It's, it's pride. It's, it's, I'm special now because I, have, I know the deep things of God. I, I'm, you know what I mean? It's just like God, God is saying, I, I'm just disgusted because what was meant for intimacy has become something that you put on the display for the whole world to see what was supposed to happen behind the closed doors in the quiet recess of your house between your husband and wife. That should happen and stay there. And just like that in the temporal, for me in the spiritual, you are the bride and I am the groom. And what happens behind closed doors should stay there. You need to stop telling everybody what's going on behind the closed doors in the intimate time of our encounter with one another. There's a whole bunch of stuff I don't preach to you. Because it's for me. It's revelation for me. It's God speaking to me. Romans 11, 25, I'm going to read it one more time. It says... But be wise. I'm scared that you'll be wise in your own opinion that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved. Listen, all Israel shall be saved. The deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. He will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Folks, we have limited ungodliness to those we call sinners. But I want you to know that there are many so-called Christians today who grace our churches who are ungodly people. Who profess to know Him, who profess to be saved. I want to propose to you today, there are preachers who are ungodly who claim to know Him, they claim to believe in Him, but they are so-called believers. They are so-called disciples. They are so-called pastors. And they are ungodly. These are people who believe to be like God is heresy. <laughs> Listen, you, you didn't think I was going there, did you? We're not like God. We can never be like God. We can never live a holy life. We can never live a righteous life. We can never do that. Only God could do that. So I'll just rest in Jesus and I will never ever be changed because how could I ever be godly? That's ungodliness. To think that way is ungodliness. God is calling a church to get to a place where they stop making excuses and saying, I could never be godly. And he says, I've called you to be godly. I've given you the power to be godly. Now go and sin no more and be godly. God's calling the church to godliness. I can never live like Jesus, ungodly. God can never use me. That's ungodly. I can never overcome this anger issue. Ungodly. 
I can never stop this addiction. Never, notice I didn't say overcome. Notice I said stop because it's a choice. I'm not saying it's an easy choice, but it's a choice. It's a choice. It's going to be hard. When, you're, when you stop, you're going to start throwing up. You need to go get some medical help probably for some of you. But you need to stop. And it's a choice. And it's not going to be fun. But it's not fun to destroy your life with it either. It's choice. And see, the church has failed some of you in here today because you have an addiction and, and, and you've just, and the church has preached this message to you that it's okay to have that addiction for the rest of your life. Although you're saved, you can just have that because you'll never be like Jesus. That's baloney. Jesus died that he might bear fruit like him. It's a lie straight from the pits of hell because when God sowed the seed of Jesus, he expect to have many sons like Jesus. And not just in heaven someday, but here on earth. He said that, that he is waiting, that all the creation is waiting to push out of the earth sons of glory. And see, we've given people with addictions permission to stay in addictions because we said it's okay to be ungodly. But he said, listen, I cut ungodliness off and say they were never saved. John tells us in the word that he will guide us into all truth. Not some truth, but all truth. So we must stop luxuriating theology that teaches us that some truth will only be revealed later. The primary purpose of the Holy Spirit is not for gifts, but rather to lead us into truth. It is not so you can speak in tongues. It is not so you can get slain in the Spirit. It is not so you can, you can speak a word and that be manifest in your life. It is not for the sake of authority. The point and the only point of the Holy Spirit, all those, those happen in some manner. It is only to lead us into truth. That's the point. See, why are we using the Holy Spirit for everything? That, that It's about truth. He wants to lead us into truth. That's the point of the Holy Spirit. Not some truth, but all truth. Into orthodoxy and orthopoxy. To lead us into right doctrine and right truth. Listen, right truth and right worship and right practice. The Spirit wants us to bring, bring, to bring us beyond what we, what we think to what He thinks. The early fathers called the Holy Spirit the mind of God. By receiving the Spirit, you receive, in other words, the mind of God. Only the Spirit of God can perceive the things of God. And you have His Spirit so you can perceive Him properly. And I'm afraid today we have a lot of so-called believers who say they perceive God, but they have not yet seen Him. And Paul is talking about the mystery of Israel's blindness. Why was Israel blind? Israel's blindness was not created by the devil, folks. Israel's blindness was created by God. It was his plan. It was God who blinded Israel. It was God who hardened the heart of Pharaoh. Pharaoh wasn't rebelling. He was doing what God wanted. So you have to be careful about rebuking things and declaring things and resisting situations in your life because oftentimes you're actually resisting God's providence. You're resisting the thing that will bring you into all truth. See, sometimes we have to be driven into desert places. That the truth in us might get out of us. Come on now. Jesus had truth in him that could only get out of him and be spoken to the, to the enemy if, if he was driven into the desert. It was in that point and at the conclusion of a 40-day fast that the enemy came to him and the truth that was in him came out of him, but it was a desert that made it happen. See, sometimes, and for some of you, the way that he's going to get the truth out of you, whether you like it or not, whether it's a gospel you can contend with or not, whether it's a gospel that gratifies your flesh or not, whether it makes you happy or not, some of you, if you're a believer in Christ, he will drive you into places that, that, that he, so he can get the truth out. Some of you are going to stay in that job that you hate. You're going to stay in that job where there's not a bunch of Christians. You're going to stay in that job where you're miserable because he's trying to get truth out, not only lead you into truth, but get truth out of you into the place he's led you to. To. And the reality is we're trying to pray truth out of that which we don't like. See, Christianity was never about your comfort. Christianity was about pursuing truth and seeking after him our whole life. He blinded them. Because if anyone, 
Listen. Galatians 11, 11 through 12 says, But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man nor I was taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. Be careful. Be careful and understand the difference between the revelation that comes from man and the revelation that comes from Christ. And know this, God removes blindness when it's time. There are people under the sound of my voice every single week that do not understand the words that are coming out of my mouth. That's all right, that's not my responsibility. There are people who just still don't get it. And that's okay, that's not my responsibility. God will remove blindness and he will remove the blinders when it is time. When it is time. Listen, if everyone came every single Sunday and they sat under my voice and everyone was not blind anymore and everyone turned to Jesus, that would create pride in me. And God is very careful. He longs that each of us will come to know him. But there is an appointed time for them where he will remove. There are some that he has put blindness on you. And he only wants to reveal that portion of the scripture to you when it is time. There is time to understand and there's a time to just trust God and have faith. Listen, if you come every day hoping and living. I used to preach hoping that every single person under the sound of my voice would get the revelation that I'm preaching. It may not be time. God has an appointed time. What is holding this generation from perception is our arrogance. And what will bring the message of the kingdom to the masses is our humility. It says when we come to God, we should get low so that he'll be high. Then we read scriptures like that and we just discard it. We put it over on the shelf. Uh, we, we need to be low so that he'll be high. And then we, we read that, put it on the shelf, and then we say things like, if, if, the, if, if the people who are called by name and name would lift me up, I will draw all men to myself. You know how you do that? Get low so he can get high. See, some of you are so busy making much of you that you make little of God. So you want to change the generation? Stop praying prayers about the change that needs to happen and get low so that he can be high. Because when he's high and you're low, when you're low, he's high. When he's high, he draws all men to himself. So the reason why we don't have all men coming to God is because we have arrogant, prideful people who won't get low and make him Lord. See, a revival is not, is not birthed out of a prayer. A revival is birthed out of humility. Out of the church saying, we need you. And we could only do this by your strength. Israel's blindness, according to what we just read, is in part because God always has a remnant. There has, there has never been a generation without someone who believed. I want you to know all the way back then, there was someone who believed. Blindness here in this word, in the Greek, comes from the root word meaning hardness. It's the same word that was used in Exodus when it spoke of Pharaoh, that his heart was blind or hard. That he hardened his heart and it affected. He could not see the same. Listen, the miraculous is not going to be the sun that brings us into the kingdom of God. Listen, I'm going somewhere. The, the miraculous is not going to be the thing that brings people into the kingdom of God. It wasn't then and it isn't that today. Come on now. Jesus said, well, if you remove yourself from the, from the cross and if you do this and if you do this, we'll believe. No, belief has never been connected to the miraculous. The miraculous have never brought true belief. It was not the belief. Many times it was the belief and the faith that brought the miraculous. <laughs> Y'all can't handle me. I'm just telling you. The point of the miraculous was not so that he could get believers. The point of the miraculous is because people believed. 
He would go into a town and he said, I could not do many works there because there was not much belief. It was belief that drove the miraculous, but yet we want the miraculous to enhance our belief. And we're still calling out like the Israelites of yesterday because we're blind to it. We don't get the point. He said, have faith in me. Have faith in the things of God. And trust me to be Lord of your life. The miraculous comes down the conduit of our connection in relationship with him. Romans 9, 18. Therefore, he has mercy on whom he wills, and whom he wills he hardens. In other words, it doesn't matter what you do. If he doesn't will it, they're not going to receive it. It's not about you. No one is getting in until God softens their heart. And I want you to know this, just, just, for, your, just for your edification, just so you don't freak out on me right now. It is God's will to soften everyone's heart that we might truly begin to see. It was his will that all blind people would be able to see. Why is this important, Sean? Why are you telling us this? Because some of us have such a passion to see other people begin to see that we create tracks, we create programs, we create classes to teach us how to go help other people see when we're blind ourselves. And we need to stop We need to stop. We need to stop trying to get out. God draws. God lifts and softens. God does all that stuff. You can't do all that. There is no program. There is no sermon. There is nothing. You could get up and preach the dumbest sermon in the history of mankind, and if God wants to use it, he can use it. He'll make the rocks cry out, and they can't even talk. Because God does what he wants. It is time for us to understand the divinity of God, how God functions, that he is all-powerful, he is all-knowing, he is everywhere at the same time, he is all-sovereign. We need to give God credit for who he is. We don't need theatrics, we don't need cool light show, we don't need hyped up messages, we don't need hyped up worship. We need the life and the light of God in our life. And see if some of us will begin to pursue the light and the life of God as much as we do our services that hype us up, we might actually be changed enough to change the world. Galatians 1:10. For do I do I but do I know, do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I am still pleased, if if I still pleased men. I would not be a bondservant to Christ. In other words, Paul is saying in another letter to the Galatian church is that you can do do one of two things. You can choose to please men or you can choose to please God. Which one will you do? You will be godly or you will be ungodly. You will be cut off from the branch or you will be brought and put in to the tree. Israel becomes hardened in its understanding. Listen, they cease to know God, they cease to know one another, and they cease to know themselves. In other words, your lack of perception of God causes a lack of perception for one another, which causes a lack of perception of self. Let's go back the other way. People hurt others because they have first hurt themselves because they have failed to perceive God properly. That's why you can't get mad at others when they hurt you because they hurt themselves first. And that's the natural cycle. And Israel gets to a place where they exalt him disconnected. Listen, following all the same rituals, praying all the same prayers, doing all the same things, Just like Israelites in the church today, sometimes we reverence to the demise of relationship. But there cannot be relationship to the neglect of reverence. Because both are perversions if it's just one in part. If all you do is revere him, then you will not know his love. But if all you do is love him, then you will only know him as friend and not as God. That's the point of today. That's the point of the last year. That's the point particularly of the last five messages. That God, yes, wants you to know he loves you. But it's time the church stopped preaching about the fact that God loves us because we should know that by now. We should begin to preach that God 
is worthy, that God is sovereign, that God is divine, that God is a judge, that God don't take no crap off nobody. That God is serious. He is to be revered. He is to be revered. You have to be able to discern when to come in reverence and when to come in relationship. And I'll propose to you today, every single Sunday, instead of coming in relationship, you should first come in reverence because you should call him holy and mighty and, and, and all-knowing and all-powerful. And out of that, you should encounter him and, 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 and call him your father. But you should come in reverence first, always. Lest you forget who he truly is. That's good stuff. That's why it says to fear him. He's saying come in reverence. Be respectful. Don't come in here any old way you please. There is an order to this. There is a method to this. You come calling me Lord. Sean, what are you you talking about? Sean, why do you not want us to feel like God loves us? That's not what I'm saying. He said to Peter, do you love me? Yes, of course, I love you. Peter, do you love me? Yes, yes, God, I love you. Peter, do you love me? Yes, God, you're getting annoying. Have you ever asked this question? I love you. He's saying, do you revere me? Because I know you see me as a friend. But see, love has many dimensions. Do you love me with a reverence that only you could revere God with? Do you know who I am? I, this came right after he said, who do people say that I am? Some say you're John the Baptist. Some say you're a prophet. Some say you're this and some say you're that. But, but who do you say I am? Well, you're the son of the living God, Lord of all, Lord and Savior of all. And he goes, good, Peter. Flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you, but the Spirit revealed that to you. That's a mystery revealed. Are you with me today? But then watch what happens, because this is what we do in the church. He defaults back to friendship. Right back to friendship. After he returns back to being a fisherman, and they're breaking bread, he returns to friendship because friendship makes us comfortable. Reverence makes us uncomfortable. A lot of theology gets broken up in this, and I know I'm going along. A lot of theology, a lot of denominations are built around this because you have, if you look at denominations, really what you have is, is the dichotomy between people who want to celebrate the love of God and people who want to celebrate the reverence of God. It's both. And the moment you begin to swing the pendulum over here, oh, God loves me, oh, God loves me, oh, God would never condemn me, oh, God would never judge me, oh, God would never hold me accountable, oh, God you know, wouldn't make me endure to the end, oh, I don't have to do anything, I pray to prayer, I never have to live, I don't have to be, he doesn't have to be Lord of my life, it's just, oh, I'm just going to sit around and, and we're just going to, oh, my goodness, and it's going to be wonderful. No, we're, we, we definitely ain't that here. So if, if that's what you need, go to another church. Log on to somebody else online because we believe that God loves us, but we believe also that we should revere him. And, and sometimes we talk so much about God's love that we are then no longer a light, track with me now, light and salt to the earth because reverence drives us to do what he's called us to do. Are you with me? I'm, I'm coming, and I'm going to set us up with this. It said that of Israel, that Israel was removed as branches because they did not fulfill their calling. Their calling was what, Sean? Their calling was that God had called them to be light to the Gentiles, and the Gentiles could not be one because they had failed their calling. I'm afraid today we want to talk so much about how much God loves us and how we're connected to the vine and how much he values us that he's about to come down in the church and rip people out that are claiming to love him and be connected with him because we We've not fulfilled our calling of being the light and salt to the earth. And just like Israel of yesterday, the church is at risk of being removed so that he can continue to draw in Gentiles. How does he draw in Gentiles? When the church becomes the salt and the light of the earth. Guess who this, okay, let me say this. I'm going to set this up for next week. Guess who this, see, some of you are like, well, how do I become the light? Beam comes out of your chest. Like, how do I become as Christian light to people? How do I do that? Christ in you, the light of the world. 
What what does Christ in you do? He leads us into all truth. That when we get to a place of opposition or darkness, the truth that we've discovered becomes revealed. But what good is light in light? And what good is saltiness where saltiness is? It's time the church began to embrace and grow up and understand that he's going to put us in dark, unsalted places so that we will change the environment instead of praying to get out of it. Israel wanted to get out of it. Israel didn't want to do their calling. And I'm afraid today the church is the same way. And this is a warning call. It is a prophetic word as much as it is a warning call to the churches that we would be mindful of our responsibility and that which we have been called to. Israel's blindness was ordained by God because she did not know who she was. She assumed, it, in that day, this is the history thing and I'm closing, she assumed the identity of the nation that she was in. Israel became like the other nations. And they had mitigated gall to dislike the very nation they became like. Just like the church today. Instead of being aliens and separated from the world, we become just like the world. And the reality is, you can't tell the difference between the world and those who come to the church. Because our lives don't look any different. Yet we have the unmitigated gall to sit around and talk bad about those who look just like us. Am I making sense in here today for people that I can't hear online? (laughs) Prejudice was born out of our fear that we have become so much like them that we have created a spiritual arrogance to luxuriate our position than to identify ourselves as them. Disobedience does not alter your calling. Gifts and callings are without repentance. Listen, and I'll pray. We have a lot to learn from Israel. It said that they took on the practices of the nation. Listen, in in some commentary, it said that they began to worship the gods of the nation. To worship idols. And their lives began to function like the nation in which they lived. And God said, you've ceased to be light to the very thing that I've sent you to be light to. I'm going to pose this question for your homes. They'll start in your homes. Has your home ceased and taken on the rituals and behaviors of the media you pipe in it. Come on now, listen to me. Do you come to church and do you belittle the world and go home and pipe media in that's reshaped your world? Well, Sean, none of us can be godly. He's called us to godliness. He he graced you to save you. He gave his spirit to empower you to go out and be the light to the world. And it's time the church stopped praying for him to do what he's called us to do so that he does not remove us like a vine dresser cuts off branches and bundle them up for the fire and for destruction. The church, listen, we are in a season that this should be a wake-up call for the church. Listen, my voice shifting in this season, it's not, I'm not alone in this. There is an urgency in the hearts of all pastors, all lead pastors. I'm telling you, there's an urgency to preach a message for the church to wake up and realize that its lover is no longer in the house. And we are at risk, like Israel was, of being removed from the thing we think we're connected to. And destruction is our doorstep, and we best wake up and smell the coffee. God, we love you very much. We're thankful for who you are in our lives.
We're thankful for your word as much as it challenges us. It still edifies us. As much as it challenges us, it still encourages us. As much as it challenges us, we are grateful for it. I believe that everyone under the sound of my voice longs to be faithful. I believe they long for more than just a ticket to heaven, but I believe that they truly desire to be used by you. God, I pray that you take the willing heart and you unfold understanding in such a magnitude that it reshapes lives this morning, that it motivates feet, that we would step into the fullness of what you called us to for the sake of your kingdom. God, we sit and we read and we look at the Israelites, we look at the Pharisees, we look at those who really cried out, crucify him. This was one of their own. And we see that and we laugh and we chuckle and we say, how could the Jews not have seen that this was the Messiah? Yet we come every Sunday morning and we are blind. We are blind to the same calling. We are blind to the same Savior. We, are blind. we see Him as Savior, but we reject Him as Lord. We are blinded in part as they were blinded in part. They saw God. They, they knew there was a Messiah. They knew there would be a Spirit. They knew all of these things. They, they knew that. They, they were blind in part, but they were not blind in full. And I believe today that the church has become blinded in part. We accept you as Savior. We reject you as Lord. We re- accept you as Savior. We refuse to be godly. God... I believe we are just as blind as the Israelites and it's causing us to not fulfill the call you've called us to as a church. Wake us up, God. Wake us up for the sake of your kingdom and for your glory. God, help those that are prideful to come low. And God, whatever it takes to humble hearts, humble them. God, if it means we get fired off our jobs, may it be so. God, if it means that we lose something that we love, Lord, may it be so. God, humble us that we may come under your mighty hand, under your hand, that the Lord may be lifted up, that all men who we claim to cry out for and claim to pray for would be drawn in to your goodness. God, less of me and more of you. God, I pray that if my will would come against your will, that my will would bow at the strength of yours. God, I pray that for every person here this morning. God, I pray that for our church and our city. I pray that for Kansas City, and I pray it for our nation. God, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Man, that was good. We want to thank you for joining us uh, online this morning from your home. We're just going to continue to worship together as a church family right now. Uh, We're worshiping through tithes and offerings here uh, in the building together and then also with you right now uh, in your home. There's a link that's going to pop up right now where you can go to echochurch.tv slash giving and you can give uh, your tithes. And I love what Pastor Sean shared about that today. Uh, let's, let's worship the Lord together and be faithful and receive his blessing on our first fruits as we tithe today. And also, uh, right now there's going to be a link that's going to pop up for you to be able to share any prayer requests or praises that you have going on in your life. Man, we love you. Even if you've been at home and we haven't got to see you here in person quite yet, we love you so much and we are excited to have our arms linked with yours and to do life together with you. So share your needs that you have. Share the praises of what God's doing in your life this week. We're so excited to hear from you this week as we receive those in and we get to pray together as a church family. And then also, we want to draw your attention there uh, is a link that's going to pop up to take you to a a place where you can see some information on uh, Facebook or on our website for the Echo Family Retreat that we have coming up. We're trying to urge people to get signed up for that. I think, Pastor Brooke, we have over 50 people now signed up for it. So it's a really great great group of people, but there is room for more. And this is going to be 
uh, an event unlike anything that we've ever done before. We've gone camping. We've all gone out, got to see each other's bedhead first thing in the morning. Like, that's awesome. But this is going to be a, a lot different. Pastor Sean's bringing in a guest speaker, and we're going to have worship. We're going to have a, a space specified for us to have worship. Meals are going to be being prepared for us. This is going to look a lot more like a retreat or a conference than camping, which is why we've changed the name on it this year. So I want to urge you to check that out and get signed up today. Every week right now, more and more people are signing up. So don't miss out. I'm not sure when the time will come. We haven't really talked about it, but there will come a time where we can't take any more signups. So don't be like I normally am. I'm the guy right now this week that's like a little stressed and a little tense because I'm trying to rush to get my taxes done. Because even though when the government gave an extension, I still waited to the last minute to call my accountant and file my taxes. And I called my accountant a few times. He picked up the phone. He's a friend of mine. He picked up the phone. He said, I'm working on it. Stop calling me. I got everybody calling me right now. Don't be the last man, you know, wait to the last minute to get signed up for, for family retreat. It's going to be awesome. Is that everything? That's everything. It is. That's right. That's right. Sorry. This is like my least favorite thing to do is the announcements at the end of the service. Uh, also, if you're a volunteer at Echo Church, we've talked about it a little bit. July 17th, at what time? At 7 p.m., we're having an event here called the Volunteer Family Reunion. We're getting all of our volunteers from across the board. We're bringing everybody together. We're casting some new vision. We're going to celebrate. We're going to love on people for a while because we've all had a few months off from doing specific roles that we've normally served in. And so this is like a recharging, it's a revamping, it's some new vision casting. If you volunteered anywhere in the life of Echo Church uh, before we, all of the COVID stuff started, wherever it was, if you were in the parking lot, if you served in the children's ministry, if you served media, hospitality, any area that you served in, this event is for you. And I got this question this last week, so if anybody else has this question, this is for you. If you have a spouse, this is just a volunteer thing. If you, have, if you volunteer but your spouse doesn't, this is just for the volunteer. I'm going to say unless your spouse is ready to sign up to volunteer somewhere. I got that question. Can our spouses come? Well, sure, if your spouse either is a volunteer or wants to sign up to serve. This is for new volunteers, too. We have a lot of new people in the life of the church. It's kind of crazy that you can close the doors to a building for three months and see the church grow numerically just by people watching on Facebook. And that's taking place. We've got a lot of new people. So if you desire to get involved, this time is for you. Man, we love you so much. I'm fighting off a sneeze right now. And so I'm going to say be blessed this week and go and, and dig into God's word and find uh, the truth of what Pastor Sean has shared today. That was, it, was, it was huge. And so right now, God's stirring something in you. Go seek that out and, and, and live that out and apply that to your life this week so that you can be becoming more like Christ. Seek him out this week. We love you. Have an awesome week.